I just want to say is, is all the study that we all do uh, is over the course of, for me, it's half my lifetime. But uh, for everyone, they do a lot of study, and when they want to share something, there's always things that they can't share because there just isn't enough time. So I'm giving you a big picture here, and hopefully it's going to be enough to either um, set you on some kind of course of investigation, or maybe it'll set you on a course to uh, refute it and help me understand where I've gone sideways, or south, you might speak. Um, so anyways, I'm always open to looking at uh, things in a new light, so to speak. So we're going to look at this today. And I want to say again, I want to qualify this as I'm not telling anyone that they have to believe this. It's just something I think we should look at uh, if for nothing else so that we know where we are is solid as a rock for no other reason than that. So before we start, let's ask for some guidance. Father in heaven, we thank you and we come before you at this time. During your feast, Father, we have come here expecting and asking for your blessing. Father, we ask that the spirit of prophecy through Yeshua speak to our hearts. Teach us things, Father, as you have promised to lead us and guide us into all truth and show us things to come. We praise you. And we glorify you in all things. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so like I've been doing, I've been uh, making you work for your food. So I want you to grab your Bibles because I know you have them. And we're going to be looking at some things here. Um, I want to look at something very interesting. A few texts that we haven't possibly seen in their... Uh, fullness. But before we do that, we're going to go and we're just going to recap what we were looking at yesterday because we didn't quite finish up uh, what we were talking about with the Exodus. So what I proposed in the Exodus, when the, when the Israelites were going to go out into the wilderness, I believe that feast, when you look at all the timing involved and taking a million plus people out into the wilderness, a three days journey, they were going to spend some time out there, not just a day or two, but they were going to celebrate a feast uh, to the Lord. So all of this was running up to something. And so what I'm, what I'm convinced of is that was during this time in here that they were going to go out to the wilderness. Wilderness feast is tabernacles feast. Uh, a commemoration of their wilderness journeys. So what I'm suggesting here, they were going to go out into the wilderness to celebrate the fall festivals. Now, why do I say that? Because fall festivals are revolve around judgment. And we know that because they weren't able to do this, and as we said yesterday, is judgment comes and goes whether we realize it or not. We want to get on to the timing of judgment. We want to understand the timing of judgment. So we're not only a little more prepared ourselves, we'll get moving, but we are able to tell others about that as well. And we see that in the book of Revelation, in four, uh, Revelation 14, verse 6, where there's a proclamation uh, by shouting, and we know what that is, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. How do we know that? Because we understand the festival calendar and judgment happens right here. The announcement of judgment is trumpets. The day of atonement is the close of judgment. If we go back to uh, Leviticus chapter 16, judgment actually closed on the day of atonement. Now, if there's an ultimate fulfillment of the day of atonement, I would say it would have a lot to do with the close of judgment. And Leviticus 16 had to do with those alive in Israel at that time. They were being judged. And I think if we look at this carefully, we're going to find out, and we saw this in, in Revelation chapter 15, is the judgment actually closes on the Day of Atonement because that's where we saw in Revelation 15, where and 16 where the ark of the covenant the tabernacle of the testimony was open no man was able to enter the tabernacle of the smoke and so on speaking directly to the day of atonement 
Now, they were going to, I believe, in the Exodus, they would celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Then I'm just not sure whether they would have kept on going up to the land of Canaan. I have no idea what was going on, would happen then. But, but however, they weren't able to go, so we can speculate on that all we want. But we know they weren't able to celebrate this. And so what happened? At the beginning, before they went, there was three plagues. I call them the ten last plagues, but there was three previous to the seven last. And these caught the attention, attention of Israel. Why was that? Because these first three plagues in the Exodus were poured out on all the people. And that was so God could get the attention and uh, that his man would be Moses. Everyone would be looking to Moses because Moses was foretelling the future, which qualified him as to be God's man. And so that's what was going on. They were gaining faith in what Moses was doing. And we know the story how that went. At the fourth plague, it switched gears and all the people in the land of Goshen, they didn't have those seven last plagues poured out on them. And of course, this would have happened, we talked about it over time, as you go through this, as you go through the dialogue from the first time they talked to Pharaoh, it wasn't just a week, it wasn't just two weeks, but it was a matter of uh, over a period of time. And that's the thing about the Bible that we don't really understand. We can have large portions of time in just a few verses. So what I'm suggesting is these, all these plagues took probably about a half a year, something like that, the distance between the fall and the spring feast. So we have judgment in the fall. And I believe that after the judgment is where the plagues, the seven last plagues, were started to be poured out on the Egyptians. And God's people were free from those plagues, uh, as it were. And then at Passover, they had their deliverance. Now, I, I'm, I'm hoping you're seeing something here with what you already know, that this actually is a pattern. Now, there's uh, Jim Mahoney, or Tim Mahoney, has a series of films, some of them are in the Red Sea, Crossing, Mount Sinai, and so on, and he has titled his uh, research Patterns of Evidence, and so what he does is he gathers all this evidence, and he sees a pattern in it, and he's able to come to some conclusions. This is all I'm doing here, is I'm looking at a pattern, and seeing this, if there's any evidence that God is going to use not only his calendar as only part of his calendar, but whether he's going to use all of his calendars. So we saw this yesterday. They were delivered. They dropped down immediately. As soon as they left Goshen, they dropped down to Succoth, I believe it is, and they picked up Joseph's bones, and they, the bones were raised up. Now this is kind of like interesting when you get to Ezekiel. Uh, there's a little story about the dry bones. Same sort of thing. That's a resurrection picture, a literal and a spiritual resurrection um, as well. And then we have the first fruits, and then they begin their journey. They left at Passover, began their journey to the promised land, but they made a little detour to pick up Joseph's bones. And that was pretty much immediately when they left Goshen, they did that. And then they went on route, and we talked about the reason why they didn't enter the promised land fairly quickly was because of their faith. And then afterwards, they came uh, at Pentecost, and uh, I believe that it's very likely that the law was given at Pentecost. This is very interesting as well, because the law was given at Pentecost, and God was present there at Pentecost. And we see in Ezekiel where the Spirit will write his law in our hearts and minds. And we will be caused to walk in his statutes and judgments and do them. And I like to, I like to tell people, the Spirit causes us to do this. So if you're feeling that you're being moved in the direction, not pulled, you shouldn't be feeling pulled, but God is guiding you into the direction of keeping his law and his statutes and so on. So there we have that one. Now let's just move this aside. I don't know, Judy, is that about, is that about right? 
Okay, she's going to adjust the camera. So what we're looking at here is a possibility, okay? This isn't concrete. It's not perfected. But I, I have a habit when I do a presentation is I do not like to speculate very much at all. So what I'm showing you are things that I feel pretty confident with the research that I've done. Doesn't mean that I have it 100% right by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but we're looking. We're looking and searching and studying. Now I want you to turn with me to... Um, First Peter, uh, this is a verse that we should know uh, in our minds, and we all, we all have read it, but we should really understand the, the deeper meaning behind this text. First Peter 1 verse 10, of this salvation, which what we're still looking for in the future, of this salvation the prophets inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. So part of the plan of salvation has been fulfilled, but we're still working it out. And of course, the feasts are giving us greater pictures of how that's going to happen. And they also give us the timing of those events. In verse 11, it says they are searching what was coming, or what manner of time that it was coming that the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the, glory, or the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. So we already know about the, the sufferings of Christ, and I find this rather disappointing. Um, when people celebrate Easter, which they did this weekend, they're always looking back in time. When people celebrate Christmas, what do they do? They're looking back in time. When we celebrate the Passover, we're not only looking back in time. We're looking at what God is doing now. But we're looking at what he's going to do in the future. So these things are actually faith-building experiences. So when we're only looking back, and this is really what the Jews are doing as well. They're just looking back at their deliverance and that unites them as a people. But they miss the whole concept when they don't realize that Yeshua was their Passover lamb. Now the question remains, yes, Yeshua fulfilled a part of the Passover, but we are not in the kingdom as yet. We are not experienced the fullness of unleavened bread being without sin and being without even the, in the presence of sin, that won't be fulfilled until the kingdom. So these, these festivals on a, are on a cyclical basis. But the pattern, the whole pattern, is the Exodus. And I find it interesting that uh, Messianics, we mixed with a lot of Messianics in, in their circles in the, when we were living in the States. We were traveling around doing meetings and we'd hit on the millennium and so on. And there is a number, there are a number of uh, messianics that are starting to look at some of these possibilities and seeing where they have been led a little bit astray by some well-meaning people, I might say. So they have a term called the greater exodus. Well, I find that rather interesting because if you have a greater exodus, you have to have a lesser exodus. Kind of makes sense to me. There's your lesser exodus. The Bible is full of patterns and types. And once we find the pattern and the type, it gives us an understanding of the future fulfillment of that. And the simplest one is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. When we start to understand who that is, and we start to understand who our priest is, and who our high priest is, and what the tabernacle actually represents, and what Jerusalem on the earth represents the city of peace, God's city of peace. It really is just a type of God's city in Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that there's a city and it's called the New Jerusalem. It's where the Mount Zion is, the city of the living God, where the angels are and so on. This Jerusalem on earth was only a type of the Jerusalem in heaven. And it was supposed to be the city of peace on earth, but the devil did his work well, and he made it the city of war. Totally, totally, um, well, he did a number on what God was trying to do for Israel. Let's just put it that way. So in order for God to help people understand that Jerusalem was done, the purpose of Jerusalem was to house the place where the Messiah would come and be crucified. 
And so when they didn't accept them, when they didn't accept the work of Yeshua on their behalf as the sacrifice for sin, and they continued sacrificing animals, God ha- was there, there was no more purpose that he could have for people that reject him. And so he allowed the Romans to come in and destroy them. This should be a lesson to all of us that we need to be careful not to reject new light. Now, I'm I'm not trying to be smart here, but I'm just trying to make a point. The Jews were God's people, but they started to go astray and started to reject light that he was bringing. And through John the Baptist and other people, and of course Yeshua, when he came, he was the light. When they rejected that light, what happened to them? That's a lesson that we need to learn as individuals. That's a lesson that we need to learn as churches and conference leaders and so on. Very, very important lesson for us to learn. Now let's get back to this, shall we? This is what we know. We are going to be delivered. We know there's going to be seven last plagues. I've got this up here now. So we're going to compare this one to this one. Now we know that there is going to be a closing of judgment. Now, if we are objective, and this is what we want to be, is objective and progressive at the same time. If we are objective, when we read Leviticus 16, we're going to realize that the judgment closes on the Day of Atonement. That's when it is over. And I'm going to say that's obviously the judgment of the living at that point. So in the time of the end, there is going to be a close of judgment. I am suggesting that is on sanctuary time, just as God has laid out in Leviticus 16. And that is the close of judgment. All Israel that made it through at the close of judgment in Leviticus 16 went to start the new year. And if it was a, if it was a jubilee cycle, they started the new jubilee cycle. Uh, I believe it was on the Day of Atonement, and they celebrated at the Feast of Tabernacles and so on. You, you guys all know that. We're not going to get into that. And so, so what happens at the close of the Day of Atonement? We see that in Leviticus chapter uh, 15 and 16. The seven last plagues are poured out. What I'm suggesting here is in the fall, when a lot of Christians now, Messianics, Jews believe that the Messiah is coming back. I don't think they understand when, but they believe he's coming back on a festival appointment. A lot of Seventh-day Adventists believe that he's coming back in the fall. In fact, a lot of you probably believe that he's coming back in the fall. But what I'm suggesting is that we have the calendar flipped as far as the second coming. You see, in the pattern, the deliverance came in the spring. The destroying angel flew over, not at the Feast of Tabernacles, but the destroying angel flies over at Passover, and he takes his people to the land of Canaan. And of course, this was just a type. This is the reality. So what we're looking at here, so we're just going to kind of go through this. I've got to keep my eyes on the time here, because we want to keep on the right time. So what we have here is the second coming. I call that, uh, as well as Messianus call it, and you people are probably familiar with it, they call that the greater exodus, patterned after the first exodus. So if we have the Passover, we have the Feast of First Fruits. This is a seven-day feast. Now, we had a question come in saying, well, if we're going to celebrate uh, the Passover in heaven, How is it that Yeshua comes and delivers us at Passover? How is it that we're going to celebrate it? Well, there is provision in the law. Don't miss this. I believe that God did know the end from the beginning, and he has put provision in the law that if you miss the most important feast of the year, which I believe to be Passover, because if you don't accept Christ, Yeshua, as our Passover lamb, can you find salvation after that? Now, in times past, people that didn't understand that, God's going to judge them. I'm not going to judge them. But as we move closer to the culmination of these events, everyone will have been presented with Yeshua 
and who he is. God is going to make sure everyone has opportunity. How can I say that? In Matthew 24, 14, it says, When this gospel of the kingdom goes to all the world, then the end shall come. So in the time of the end, people are going to know both the name of Jesus and the name of Yeshua. They're going to realize that if they want to, they're going to be presented with the idea that they need to come back to the Sabbath. They need to come back to all God's appointed times. They need to come back to the Torah. This is what it tells us in Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, before the great and terrible day of the Lord, and so on. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded in Horeb. So this is an end time message that we're preaching, which is styled after the message of not only Elijah, when he went to the king, you're the trouble of Israel because you have forsaken what? You have forsaken what? The commandments of the Lord. And this is what our message is to call people back to obedience to all of God's commandments, all those things that he requires us to do, not because they're arbitrary, but because he loves us and he wants a hedge around us while we're in this land of the enemy and in this land of captivity. So these things obviously are for our best good. We don't celebrate them to be saved. We celebrate them because we are saved and they have uh, many things to be celebrated. Okay, so the question was, How's this going to happen with Passover? Well, you see, in the law, if you come in contact with a dead body, let me back up a second. The reason why I said the Passover is the most important feast of the year, and it's the only feast of the year that has a special meal that goes with it. None of the others. Did they celebrate? Yes. But there isn't a specific meal that they go with it. This is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This is after the bride has made herself ready. She's purified her, she's got purified garments, and she sits down and eats this Feast of Unleavened Bread in the unleavened area of God's kingdom, which Yeshua told us in John 14, where I'm going to the Father's house and I'm going to come again and receive you to myself to take you there. He's coming to pick up his bride to celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb at the Father's house. So if he comes here and he picks us up here, the provision in the law is that if you come into contact with any dead bodies, or if you're on a long journey, you can actually celebrate the Passover in the second month according to the same ordinances. You have to do all the stuff that is contained in there. So what I believe right here is the second Passover is going to be called into effect because those living at this time, very likely, we know they're fleeing in the wilderness, trying to get away, which is what they're doing. They're hiding in caves and so on. And also, there's a very good chance that they've come in contact with dead bodies. And so, good chance they're not going to be able to celebrate it because of what's happening. And Yeshua will come, and they will sit down in the second month, I believe. That's why the provision is in the law, because God knows the end from the beginning. He knew what was going to happen here long ago, and so there is provision in the law to do this. Making it the most important uh, day... <clears throat> of the bride's wife. Now, if, if you people that are married out there, when was the most important day of your bride and you? And I think that is a pretty easy statement. The most important day was the when you tied the knot, right? That was the most important day. So in that sense, this is a very important day with a very special meal called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, Revelation 19 says that the bride has made herself ready and she goes in and they celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb. And of course, there's many other there. The great multitude is also there to celebrate with them. So how does this all start in the time of the end? It actually starts here at Passover because as we practice these things, what does it do? Practice makes perfect, 
Right. So as we're practicing these things, we're getting greater insights. We're understanding more truth. And it's giving us a better understanding of God and what his plan is. In Jeremiah, it talks about God knows the plans he has for us. And they are good and righteous and so on. And so this is what the Passover, all of these feasts represent, is the, are the plans that God has for us. So as we start to understand his ways better, including the festival calendar, it brings us into a closer relationship with him. And the practice of these things makes us perfect. It's a sanctification process. Now, are the feasts the only things that make us perfect? No, but they have a lot to do with the sanctification process and our understanding of God and his character. So it starts at Passover. So if we keep the Passover today, do you suppose we'll be keeping the Passover next year and the year after and the year after and the year after? Absolutely. So we're going to be on this schedule all the way through to the end because we're practicing the, the great event. So at Passover, there will be a renewal on the last year, and that's not, I don't believe, next year or the year after or even the year after. But it is sometime in the future, that last Passover, and that will be the last time that people will be able to keep the Passover here on earth. Now, does that mean that everyone's lost? No, not, we're not lost until this time. But we know something very interesting that God is not going to pour out his spirit, his entire spirit, the filling of the spirit, like Yeshua experienced at his, at his baptism. He was filled with the spirit. We are being filled with the spirit. That's an ongoing process. But I believe, I'll just move that over a little bit. I believe that at Pentecost, on the last cycle, will be the time when God pours out his spirit on all flesh that's alive. And those that are without spot and wrinkle will get the entirety of the spirit. And they will be the ones that go out and finish the gospel work. And they will have from Pentecost all the way through, they will come up to here and they will declare, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. That's how they know. They are totally in sync with the spirit of God. At the day of atonement, the judgment closes and then the seven last plagues are poured out. But before that, I should have an S on here because there are seven trumpets that start. And it looks like to me, if somebody's got more light on this, I'd be, you know, appreciate it. It looks to me that the trumpets start sometime prior. Is it a month? Is it two months? Uh, is it seven months? Uh, very interesting. Seven trumpets, one at the first day of each month. I'm not sure. Uh, about that there's some possibilities but I believe it starts before uh, the seven last plagues are poured out these are the same type of judgments as the first three plagues to bring everyone that's still alive into God's fold it's kind of the last chance so to speak for them and then after that um, the seven last plagues are poured out we know when we look at the seven trumpets and we look at the seven plagues they both finish at the same point. So we know they overlap at least to a degree. And I'm talking now the end time application of the seven trumpets. And of course we know that there's been attempts to apply those in the past and that they were applications and they worked and so on. Uh, but the culmination of all of this, the time of the end, we're going to see a lot of these prophetic uh, things that we thought were completely done away with. Uh, they're going to rise again uh, and have a fulfillment in the time of the end. So now um, we might have some questions on this. I think I've covered most. Oh, there's one more point that I want to make. I want you to grab your Bibles here and turn with me to uh, Luke chapter 17. Now, this is, this is circumstantial evidence, okay? So this, isn't, this is just a little snippet that I found to be kind of interesting. 
Luke chapter 17, verse 20. I want to start at verse 20. Give you a moment to get there. Luke chapter 17, verse 20. When he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, so here's the question, when is the kingdom of God coming? Did the Pharisees, they were just trying to nail him, we know that. They were asking questions that were trying to box him in. And so he answered those questions accordingly to who was, answer, or who was asking him. Were they asking him honestly or were they actually trying to trick him? And we know all about that. So he answered according to who was asking him. And this is what he does. Very interesting. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, you see, I'm asked today, how long do you think we have? And I don't like that question. Uh, number one, it comes from a heart that I'm not sure actually wants to know all the truth because the truth is, is we've got a time of trouble coming. And if we're not prepared for that time of trouble, we're going to be going through horrible times here on earth because we haven't made the preparation we need to make. So to say when Yeshua is coming, say 10 years down the road, say seven years down the road or whatever, actually good, puts people back in their comfort zone and they sit in their chair and they pull it back like the big lazy boy and they get comfortable. So I don't like that question when people ask that question. I have my own ideas, but I, I'm very careful about saying that. I don't know the day and the hour, but I do believe we're getting close. We're getting close. <clears throat> we're in the time of preparation for that coming for sure. So they were asking, they weren't asking a certain question. They weren't asking the question they gave an answer for. They wanted to know when the kingdom in glory was coming. And you see, that's the difference for us, is we want to know when the kingdom of glory is coming. The Messianics, and bless their hearts, they are all consumed in the glories of the millennial reign because they're going to be able to reign on thrones with Yeshua and they're going to be the Torah police that are going to be reigning over a bunch of sinners. How would you like that job for a thousand years? No thank you. And uh, I don't want any part of that job. I don't like it. That's not why I don't accept, accept it, because I think it's a false doctrine. Many, many reasons for that. That's for another day. But uh, so Yeshua was asked when the kingdom of God were, was coming. They were looking for the glory kingdom where they would reign over all the earth and, and the Gentiles would then bow down to them and so on. This is exactly what the Messianics are looking for in the coming reign during the millennium. The kingdom of God does not come with observation. Wow, really? It does, you mean I'm not going to be able to see when Yeshua comes? Well, you see, he was truthful in his answer, but he didn't give them the answer they were looking for. He said, don't miss this, nor will, I say, nor will they say, see here or see there, for the kingdom of God is within you or in your midst, better translated. <clears throat> in other words, the king, the king was in their midst. So the king of the kingdom was in their midst. So it was an absolute true statement. And he was trying to show them that he was the king of the kingdom. And it wasn't coming the way they were expecting. Is there a time when it will come in glory? Absolutely, there is a time. But it was in their midst among them. And this was the point that he was trying to get through to the Jews. Then he said to his disciples, The days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see. The whole context here is timing. That's what it's talking about. It's talking about the timing of the kingdom. That's the context of what we're looking at. And they will say to you, look here or look there. And he says, do not go after them. So there's going to be a time, I believe, that in Earth's history, when they're going to be focused on a person, 
that will be a counterfeit Yeshua or Jesus. And he will be <clears throat> going all over the world. He will be healing the sick. He will, making, he will be making all the same things, statements that Yeshua did. And he will rally everyone together as if he is the coming of the Messiah. Now, do you think that this masquerade of the chief deceiver is going to happen prior to Yeshua's coming or it will happen after Yeshua's coming? I hope you can figure that one out. Obviously, he has to do this before Yeshua comes. If the whole world at this time, the Messianic world, the Jews, the Christians, which are coming to a, a bit of a knowledge on the festival calendar, some are coming out and so on, if the whole world is looking at the wrong time of the calendar, six months before Yeshua comes back, and they are convinced that he's coming at that, uh, the fall, <clears throat> then I believe they will look. And if they look, they will be deceived. You see, we just go back to the Garden of Eden. You will know the end from the beginning back in the garden of eden what was it that deceived eve you see what deceived eve according to the bible is that she saw and that's what deceived her that's why yeshua says don't look well i'll tell you what if 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 yeshua is coming in at the passover and people are telling you that he's here down here, what are you going to do? You're not going to look because it's the wrong time of year. It's no question that almost the whole Christian world is coming to a knowledge a little bit about the feast, and they're starting to study them. And the whole Messianic world is talking about the fall second coming. <laughs> and as I said yesterday, I believe that the Messianic world is a, a beautiful tool in the hands of the arch deceiver as a counterfeit. They keep the law, they keep the Sabbath, they keep the feast, they eat the, you know, the clean meats and so on. It's a, it's a perfect counterfeit. So what I'm suggesting, we need to have a nice look at this thing, see if there's any patterns to the evidence that I'm trying to present and, and go from there. So we go on here and it says, and they will say to you, look here or look there. Do not go after them. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part of the heaven that shines to the other part of heaven, so also shall the Son of Man be in that day. So there's two things. What is coming and when it's coming. When we know what is coming and we know when it's coming, we need not be deceived. My Bible says that the, the Antichrist has the ability to bring fire down from heaven in the sight of men, which deceives people. I don't know what that's going to look like, but it could have something to do with the false second coming. I don't know, but we wouldn't want to rule that out. So it goes on here, but first he must suffer. So now he's going back to his own day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. So Yeshua says, I'm among you. The kingdom is among you. And then he says, but first I have to suffer. And then the glories are going to come after that. So he goes on to say, and as it was in the days of Noah, so will it also be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married, they were given in marriage until the day, until the day, we're still talking about time, until the day came when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was in the day's time of Noah, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day, timing, that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. I believe these are types of the time of the end. Very interesting. Sodom and Gomorrah, Feast of Unleavened Bread. Is it proof solid? No, maybe not. But we know that there was utter destruction at that time. The destroying angel flew over, over here at the Passover. He flew over at the time of Lot. 
destroyed by fire. We know that when Yeshua comes back, the most powerful force in the whole universe, the one that breathes out atoms out of his mouth, speaks worlds into existence. When he shows up, I don't know what's going to happen to this planet, but we know there's going to be the greatest earthquake there has ever been. That kind of power showing up at this planet is going to rip this thing wide open, and this is what's going to happen. The fires from that will destroy all those that are living, and God will take those back to his father's house. Now, the interesting one is Noah, because Noah got on the boat. You want to do some research on this. Is Methuselah was 969 years old. He died at the year on the year of the flood. Let's think about this now. If he died in the year of the flood, and if Noah represents the exodus over here, then on the 14th day of the month of the flood, 14th day of the year of the flood, on the first month, would have been the time that Noah, I believe, would have celebrated the Passover. But because Noah had to bury his grandfather, because Lamech was already dead, very likely he was taking care of uh, Methuselah, he would have come into contact with a dead body. So he wouldn't have been able to celebrate. Well, how do I know he died in the first 14 days of the year? Well, he, we know he died in the year of the flood. So it was within the first 14 days. How close was it to Passover? Well, there's another thing that's very interesting, is Noah was in high gear for preparing to be on a long journey. And of course, we know what that was. That was in the boat. So in two counts, possibly, he wasn't able to celebrate the Passover. But it says in the second month, on the 17th day, when he was sealed inside the ark of God, that the waters came and the flood happened. So this is the second month now, and we talked about this already. They were to celebrate it in the same way that they were supposed to do it in the first month. Well, on the 10th day, you select your lamb. On the 14th day, you sacrifice your lamb, and that's when you're sealed. You see, we are sealed in a sense as soon as we accept the lamb as our lamb of God and our Passover, and so we're sealed. So Noah would have done all of this stuff. And then he went on to the ark, and on the 17th day, the waters burst forth, and, uh, and then the ark floated in for safety. And of course, everything broke loose. The wicked were all destroyed at that time. So what I'm trying to say here is that second Passover here uh, is actually represented in the time of Noah as well. So we see these little glimpses, these little tight types as we go. So we're going to um, we're going to move this over now and I'm sure there's lots of questions and, and that's okay. So we'll take questions and if we don't have time at the end, which we probably won't have too, many, too much time, uh, email us. I'll, I'll do all that stuff and we'll, uh, we'll try and get to some of this stuff. Now, what we're looking at now is the third coming. So we want to finish this up with the third coming. And when I say the third coming, I'm talking about after the millennium. And people say, well, why do you call that the third coming? We're only used to the first coming and the second coming. Well, technically, when Yeshua came the first time, he came from, where did he come from? Heaven, right? He was born here. He came in the flesh the first time. He was there present with God's people, but he was in his Shekinah glory and the cloud and, and the light and so on. But this time he came in the flesh. In the second coming, it's hard to say what he's going to look like, but John tells us that when he shows up, we are going to be like him, so we will be glorified into whatever he looks like today, which I find to be a a pretty incredible promise. So we have that to look forward to. But in the third coming, we're coming. We're going to go to heaven after the second coming uh, when he comes back. And then we're going to come back. So that's why I call it the third coming. So the third coming of Yeshua will actually be that we will be included. And I believe this is what 
Enoch spoke about in the book of Jude when he said the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones or saints. That's actually God declaring the end, the end of the story from way back at the beginning. You see, God doesn't come with ten thousands of his saints. It's talking about you and me now. He does not come back to earth until after the millennium when he comes back with all these uh, saints. We're not going to go through the, all the events of this, but you guys are really familiar with, uh, with X, sorry, um, Revelation chapter 20 and 21. And so on, like I said, we have a, I think it's 11 part series on the millennium because we believe it is so vitally important for us to understand the true nature of that and what's going to be going on. During this time, from the second coming to the third coming, we know we have plus or minus, maybe exact, a thousand years. What are we going to be doing? First Corinthians chapter 6 tells us what we're going to be doing. We're going to be judging. And I mentioned the other day, how long is this judgment going to take? Well, it says in Revelation 20 that they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But it also says they will be judging during that time period. So that's what's going on here. What are we judging? We're judging God, actually. When you really consider what we're judging, we're judging the plan of salvation right from the very beginning, right from when Satan decided to go sideways in heaven. We're going to be able to see all of that, and we're going to be able to see how righteous God was. And so at the end, at the third coming, what's going to happen? That's what we want to look at. I believe we know there's going to be a resurrection. Let's look at that. Let's go to John chapter 5. We want to look at that verse here. Give you a moment to get there. <clears throat> John chapter 5, Yeshua starts talking here. Make sure I got the right verses. I'm going to start at verse 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. And we have a hard time with this verse. It says you won't come into judgment. Do you know which judgment he's talking about? He's talking about this judgment at his third coming. He goes on to say, Most surely I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Now he did this. He's done this again just the same way he did to the Pharisees. In his day, if we heard the voice of the Son of God and put our faith in him, your everlasting life actually starts at that point. That's wonderful. We, if we have accepted Yeshua and are moving forward with him, we have eternal life right from that point forward. Now, it might be interrupted with a bit of a sleep somewhere along the, the way, but God does not count that death as we count it, but we count it as a rest. And I tell people, look, I have a little bit of an understanding about what's going to be going on here. If I end up sleeping through some of this, I'm going to be okay with that. Would I like to be among those living when Yeshua comes? Absolutely. I strive for that. But you know what? If God puts me to sleep and I have a little rest, that's okay. So let's look here at the third coming. So he goes on to say here, it says, For as the Father has life in himself, he has granted the Son to have life in himself. So the Son gives us spiritual life, and he will also give us literal eternal life. He has given him authority to execute judgment, also because he is the Son of Man. This is really interesting. When I talk about executing judgment, there's a judgment before the execution of judgment. The execution of judgment is when the judge says, you are booked and you have 10 years in jail. I believe that's actually what he's talking about here. He's talking about the saved here won't come into this judgment, but in this judgment, the Son of Man has the power to execute the judgment. 
because he has gone through all the same things that we have. He's actually the only one that's qualified to do this work. Let's move on, shall we? So I am, that's the wrong chapter. Got to go back. Okay. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Where do you get the idea in this text that there's a thousand years between the resurrection of the righteous and the resurrection of the wicked? It isn't there. But if we just go by one text, we're not going to see it. We've got to look a little here, a little there. We also see this in the book of Daniel when it says the same thing in Daniel chapter 12. It says at the time that Michael stands up, there will be a resurrection of the righteous and the unrighteous, it says there. It does not say a thousand years. We don't get to the thousand year period until the book of Revelation. In fact, you won't find a thousand years mentioned in the Old Testament. This is why. This is one of the main reasons why Messianics won't teach it and they don't like it the way we teach it because in the Tanakh or the Old Testament in the writings of Moses there's no indication somebody says well there is an indication because that's the seventh millennium well I've challenged people to find the seventh millennium 2020 hindsights now that we're on this side and we're in moving into the seven thousandth year we can see that there was hints of it but certainly if you were back there, you may not have been able to see it that clearly and so on. So now on this side, we can see that. So it goes forth here and it says that, and they will come forth to the resurrection of life and the resurrection of condemnation. I believe that those two resurrections, there is a thousand years between them. Now, people like Caiaphas and special people like them, uh, it, Revelation does seem to indicate in Revelation 1 verse 7 is they will get an opportunity to see Yeshua coming in the clouds of heaven, uh, but they will only die again shortly after that. And that's God's, not only his wisdom, his grace, and uh, they're going to get uh, what they actually asked for. And so here it says here that they've come for the resurrection of condemnation. So that resurrection of condemnation is actually here. We don't go through this judgment. The judgment that we went through was back here. Yeshua is talking about this judgment. We don't have to go through that because our judgment is behind us. And our judgment was based on Yeshua and not based on us because we're all sinners qualified to die forever. But because of what Yeshua has done for us, that gets us into the heavenly Canaan and we come back to earth after. So here's the question. I'm going to do a tiny bit of speculating here. Uh, I would like a, a better story on this so I'm, I'm totally open as I said before. The only resurrection type I see in the Bible is at the time of first fruits. Is it possible because Yeshua refers to the resurrections is it possible that at the Passover, at the first fruits, is when the wicked are raised? I don't know. It's just an idea, um, I, but it's, I'm entertaining that idea. I believe that the wicked will be raised at the end of the millennium. They will be all spread all over the earth. And we know that they're going to come up on the breadth of the camp. That's the holy Jerusalem that has come down. And they will surround the city and they will want to take the city. Why do they want to take the city? Because they want eternal life and they know that the tree of life is inside the city. You see, that's Satan's deception is you can have your sin and eat it too and still have eternal life. So he's going to rally the troops to take the city to get to inside the city where the tree of life is so that they can live forever. But Revelation tells us that the only people that have a right to the tree of life and can enter in through the gates of the city are the righteous, those that are saved. So let's, let's just entertain that idea. What happens at Pentecost? Well, we know what happened back at Pentecost in the Exodus is the Mount Zion was on fire. 
this mount that represented Mount Zion or God's presence. Is it possible that God's presence in the holy city, that city that is so bright and large, comes down at Pentecost and there's some kind of rainbow and the whole thing, and I, I use the word rainbow carefully, but God had the rainbow first, so we're going back to the first use of the term rainbow. I don't know. I'm just putting some ideas out there. We know, this is what we know for sure, the judgment at the end is on the side of the calendar that has everything to do with judgment. We know that God has the wicked, or the wicked are surrounding the city, Satan has them surrounding the city, and we know that the fire comes down. We also know that that's the great, it's called the great white throne judgment. Well, the great white throne judgment doesn't happen at Passover. It happens in the fall, at the fall feast. So you have trumpets. I believe trumpets in this time set is the announcement of judgment. Now, Satan forgets to tell the people that he's rallying that they're actually coming up for judgment. He doesn't bother to tell them that. But they're actually going to be coming up for judgment. And the close of judgment is when the execution of the judgment is made and the wicked are all destroyed. Okay, so what happens next after that? Of course, what we have after the destruction on the great judgment, this is the ultimate judgment, this is the ultimate day of atonement, when all those are tucked inside the city that are saved and all those outside the city will be lost. Revelation is very clear on that. So then they celebrate after the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Tabernacles. What is the Feast of Tabernacles? I should have brought some, some green branches in here. But what they do is they go into the bush and they're, they're rehearsing their wilderness journey, but it actually points forward to when God provides our dwelling places. He doesn't do that at the second coming. He does that at this coming. He does that at the third coming. The earth is made new. Very interesting. I find this extremely interesting. How long is the Feast of Tabernacles? How long is it? Don't say eight days. It's actually seven days. There's another day tagged on to the end called the last day or the eighth day. Or according to the book of John, it was called the last great day. That's what John called it. If there's the plan of salvation and we have the last great day, then that would be the last great day of the plan of salvation. So what happens? So we celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles when God is recreating this earth to better than its Edenic state. How long did it take to create the earth the first time? We know that it took seven days. The heavens were, were made. The earth was made, the lush surroundings were made. The Feast of Tabernacles, when God provides our living green houses and dwellings. I can't wait for that. These are all these promises are tied up in the feast. The last great day is when God opens the gates of the kingdom after he's finished the creation. He opens the gate and the foundation, the, the world that was made at the foundation is then given back to the saved at the end. The meek shall inherit the earth. You see, we don't inherit the earth at the second coming. It's laid barren and waste for Satan and his angels to look at each other and, sh and talk about all the destruction and havoc that they have made. And this is God's justice as well. It's his love and it's his mercy. But these people that come up at the end, they fight against God again, proof positive that there's nothing that God could have done. If he would have raised them 50 times, they would still be deceived. So this, this resurrection at the end is to demonstrate that these people will be deceived no matter what. Why? Because they loved their sin more than they loved God. You see, this is the problem. This is the whole plan of salvation. It's all about how God deals with sin. 
He purifies us, makes us righteous so that we can go to his father's house. And then we come back and we inherit the earth. And someone might say, oh, no, no, he has to come at tabernacles. And I understand that because he has to come back at tabernacles because that's when the Jubilee happens. Well, wait a minute. We've got to think this through for a moment because Yeshua actually doesn't have to come back on the feast on a Jubilee. The Jubilee would happen if it was to happen. It would happen down here. That's exactly right. Now, the interesting part, when you go back and you look at the, the kinsman redeemer back in the law of Moses or the Torah, the kinsman redeemer can actually come back at any time during the Jubilee cycle. He doesn't need to come back at the end of the Jubilee cycle. So if Yeshua, which I believe he is, he is the kinsman redeemer because he is our brother and he's come to redeem us, he can come back at the second coming any time during the cycle of the Jubilee. Now, part and parcel of the Jubilee and the restoration that happened at the end of the Jubilee cycle was that the people got the land back that was originally theirs. That does not happen until after the millennium when the meek inherit the land that was taken from them because they lost it because they went into slavery. So actually the culmination of the millennium and the Feast of Tabernacles and so on does not happen until after this point. So in closing, in closing I just want to say that Zechariah chapter 14 tells us the same story. You've got eyes uh, dissolving, tongues dissolving, fire, uh, total annihilation of those that are not coming up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Now the wicked at the end are coming up at the time of Tabernacles, just before the celebration of Tabernacles, but they're certainly not coming up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And we know that they will get the plague that's poured out here. So Zechariah 14 actually fits right in here at the destruction of the wicked. Now, why does all of this matter? It could matter because if we don't ultimately understand this, do we have to understand this today? Is this correct? That's up for you to make that decision. But as we move forward, we're going to understand more and more on these things. And it's my desire to keep people focused on, on what God and how he's trying to lead us today. And that will help us for tomorrow. So I want to close there at this point. So let's uh, have a word of prayer for closing. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, which is so full of information. And that's what you want us to do is just be consumed in your word to keep us on the right path and not so distracted in this world. Father, whether we have it right or whether we have it wrong, you have us in your word and that's your goal. Father, we ask that you would be with us now and bless the other meetings that are coming on. Father, uh, may your presence be felt with each of us that we would know that we have been with Yeshua. We pray this in his name. Amen.